Everybody, the moment has finally happened. A rare occurrence of two Texios coming together and actually getting along while having a fruitful conversation about the world's future. First off is where this keynote took place at a research conference called SIGGRAPH. And if you've never heard of it before, worry not because you are not alone. It is my first SIGGRAPH. Mark, welcome to your first SIGGRAPH. So what kind of conference is it exactly? So whether it's computer graphics or simulation, artificial intelligence, robotics, all of it comes, right, comes together right here at SIGGRAPH. And that's the reason why I think you should come to SIGGRAPH from now on. You know you need to be paying attention to it when Jensen Huang is a personal hype man for it. 100% of the world's tech press should come to SIGGRAPH. You know what else has been getting a lot of press attention? Zuck's fashion choices. You are quite the style icon now. Check, check out this guy, huh? Early stage, working on it, <laughs> working on it. He's definitely evolved from his early days of wearing the same thing every day to now wearing something that no other CEO has ever worn. But there's a reason for it, and that has to do with the technology that he's working on. When we think about the next computing platform, we kind of break it down into mixed reality, the headsets, and the smart glasses. Pretty much everyone who's wearing a pair of glasses today will end up, that'll get upgraded to smart glasses, and that's like more than a billion people in the world, so that's gonna be a pretty big thing. Having it in a pair of stylish, kind of chunkier frame glasses is not that far off. If a big part of the future of the business is gonna be building um, kind of stylish glasses that yeah. people wear, um, this is something I should probably start paying a little more attention that's to, right? right? Yeah. Then, totally, so yeah. Totally. Exactly. Make my way into becoming like a style yeah. influencer so I can like influence this before, um, you know, before the glasses come to the market. I guess you could say he's a product of his own products. But hey, props to him for talking the talk and walking the walk. Pulling all the stops to make sure that the Ray-Ban sales will be better than the Quest sales. And I quite agree with his approach. When we went from watches to smartwatches, the market received it very well. So that's a good indicator for going from glasses to smart glasses. For the AR and VR headsets that have entered the market, like the Quest and Vision Pro, they've been slow to take off, likely because it's too big of an experience leap for the user. That being said, even if Meta is first to market with the smart glasses, how they go about the software and user experience will also be key. Like, if they try to make me sign into the glasses with a Facebook account like they do with the Quest, then that could deter a lot of customers. Now for NVIDIA. They're most known for their GPUs, but are they just a hardware company? We've always been a software company um, and even first. And the reason for that is because accelerated computing is not general purpose computing. What Jensen means with that is if NVIDIA were only or primarily a hardware company, then they would be doing only general computing. But it's the fact that they do both hardware and software that they are capable of accelerated computing. NVIDIA didn't produce just GPUs. They also developed CUDA, and that is what has allowed AI to get to where it is today. And you have to design an accelerator, you have to design the CUDA GPU, so that it understands the algorithms, so that it could do a good job accelerating it. By doing so, by redesigning the whole stack, we can accelerate applications 20, 40, 50 times, 100 times. For example, in the case of deep learning, over the course of the last 10 to 12 years or so, uh, we've accelerated deep learning by a million times which is the reason why it's now possible for us to create these large language models. For context, let's look at the last decade of compute growth. Accelerated computing has 1,000 x to get to 20,000 teraflops, whereas general computing would look something like this at um, one teraflops. And NVIDIA doesn't stop just there. So it's not just about building the accelerator. You have to build the whole stack. The full stack of the library and the architecture and the go-to-market and the developers and the ecosystems around it to open up a new field. It takes a new library. We call it DSLs, domain-specific library. In generative AI, that DSL is called QDNN. For SQL processing uh, data frames, it's called QDF. For quantum emulation, it's called QQuantum. You know, the number of coups uh, goes on and on. Every time we introduce a domain-specific library, it exposes accelerated computing to a new market. So yeah, all this advanced hardware plus the whole software stack. We're a platform company. And here's the next frontier of platforms that NVIDIA is spearheading, robotics. The next wave of AI after that is called physical AI. And this is, this is really, really quite extraordinary. This is where we're gonna need three computers. One computer to uh, create the AI another computer to simulate the AI. 
both using synthetic gen uh, synth for synthetic data generation, as well as a place where the AI robot, the human or robot or the, the manipulation robot, could go learn how to uh, refine its AI. And then, and of course, the third AI is the computer that actually runs the AI. So it's a three, a three computer problem. You know, it's a three body problem. Together, these computing platforms are empowering developers worldwide to bring us into the age of physical AI powered humanoid robots. And so not only is robotics a new frontier, but NVIDIA is also taking care of every single step within the pipeline, within the platform. And that could continue to play very well to their advantage in the long term. And I'm going to emphasize the significance of synthetic data here. We're moving away from human collected data to synthetic data, as that allows your training to be more controllable and scalable in ways that human collected data can't be, thus leading to machine learning models that are more robust. And data is not going to be the only thing that's synthetic here. You can be too. Amazing graphics researchers, welcome to SIGGRAPH 2024. We have entered into the territory of custom AI agents and digital humans, a vision that both Mark and Jensen share. Are you going to build a Jensen AI that lives forever? Absolutely, there's a Jensen AI. In fact, just about everything that I've ever said, everything that I've ever written and ever done uh, will likely be ingested into one of these uh, uh, generative AI models. And then uh, in the future, you'll be able to prompt it and, and hopefully something smart gets said. <laughs> A lot of our vision is that I don't think that there's just going to be like one AI model. We want to empower all the people who use our products to basically create agents for themselves. So whether that's you know all the many many millions of creators that are on the platform, or you know hundreds of millions of small businesses, um, we eventually want to just be able to pull in all your content and very quickly stand up a business agent and um, be able to interact with your customers and you know do sales and customer support and all that. Uh, the concept of uh, digital uh, agents, uh, digital AIs, uh, that will augment every single job in the company. Uh, everybody will have an AI that is an assistant. And so every single company, every single company, every single job within the company will have AIs that are assistants to them. Uh, our software programmers, as you, so you know, now have AIs that help them program. Uh, we have AIs that help our chip designers design chips. Basically create their own agents for all different kinds of uses. Some will be sort of customized utility, things that they're trying to get done that they want to kind of fine tune and, and train an agent for. Some of them will be entertainment or kind of have a funny attitude about things that um, we, we probably wouldn't build into meta AI as an assistant, but, but I think people are kind of pretty interested to see um, and interact with. That has the ability to uh, speak, make eye contact with you, um, anim animate in an empathetic way um, and uh, uh, you could decide to ch connect your ChatGPT or your AI to the digital human. So the next frontier of AI models is, now that we have this big general central foundation model, we'll spawn all these fine-tuned versions of it nice. per nice. use case, it per person, defined. per company, and it'll have the ability to appear here, realistic here. too. All this sounds amazing slash scary, and rather than gatekeeping this great tech, both companies have made the technologies available to everyone. We're just starting to roll out more now. Is um, We call it AI Studio, and it basically is um, a set of tools that eventually is going to make it so that every creator can build sort of an AI version of themselves. We created this thing called an AI Foundry. We provide the tooling. We provide the expertise, uh, Llama uh, technology. Uh, we have the ability to help them uh, turn this whole thing uh, into an AI service. And, yeah. and then when, when we're done with that, uh, they take it, they own it. We, the output of it's what we call a NIM. And this NIM, this, this Neuro Micro NVIDIA Inference Microservice. AI Foundry and NIM were actually introduced only a few months ago at NVIDIA GTC. And now they're making it publicly available already. I made a video explaining the technology stack if you want to learn more about it. As for my next video, I'll be testing out their new tools through my lens as a machine learning engineer. So if that interests you, subscribe to stay tuned for that. Now the next question is, why open source it? Both companies have invested millions and billions into these platforms and models. Why share it for free? We're not doing this because we're kind of altruistic people. I mean, we're doing it because we think that this is going to make the thing that we're building the best. You know, we've done it with a bunch of our 
kind of infrastructure tools, things like React, PyTorch. Um, so I'd say by the time that Llama came around, we were sort of positively predisposed towards doing this. There will always be a closed one and an open one. I think that there's reasons to do both. There are benefits to both. I'm not like a zealot on this. I mean, we do closed source stuff. I'm not everything that we, that we publish is open. But I think in general for the computing platforms that the whole industry is building on, there's a lot of value for that if the software especially is open. So it becomes something of an industry standard. Other folks do work around it, right? So like all of the silicon and the systems will end up being optimized to run this thing really well, which will benefit everyone, but it will also work well with the system that we're building, which had this benefit of saving money for everyone. So by making it public um, and open, we basically have saved billions of dollars from doing that well, work. Well, open compute was also what made it possible for NVIDIA HGXs that we designed for one data center all of a sudden it works in, yeah, works in yeah. every data center. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that the open source strategy is gonna be, yeah, it's is gonna be a good one as a business strategy. And there you have it. It's like they say, if it's free, then you are the product. And that's everything from the keynote. But of course, a it's CEO like bromance isn't sure. complete oh. without doing another <laughs> jersey swap. How freaking wholesome is this? Yeah, hug it out. You know we love to see this warm, buddy-buddy energy in tech. And it has to start from the top, where it's cool to care about fashion and sports and have diverse interests. It's a change that I can get behind.